Hello? When the word NoSQL became popular a few years ago, it was a synonym for scalable, efficient, and most of all, cheap distributed storage. How could it be cheap? How could it be cheaper than conventional relational databases by giving up asset guarantees of SQL transactions? Hence the word NoSQL. In the meantime, we found out that transactions are an invaluable tool for developers. They make our lives so much easier when we try to build reliable data applications. And as a consequence, we are seeing a re-emergence of transactions in the NoSQL world. And nowadays, the word NoSQL doesn't mean no SQL anymore. It means not only SQL. I am Andreas Neumann. I work for Continuity. And I will show you how we implemented transactions over one of these NoSQL databases, namely HBase. I'm going to start with a quick motivation. Why do we need this? I will show you how we implemented it, and then I'll quickly do uh, some uh, abstractions, future, and if there's time for questions without eating into your lunchtime, I'll be happy to do that. Okay, who are we? Um, my company is Continuity. It's this uh, little, little dark blue rectangle down here. And um, what we do is we provide simple access to powerful technology. Um, what does that mean? We have built uh, an application server for big data. It's called the Continuity Reactor. And uh, that makes it much easier to build big data applications than if you program directly over Hadoop and HBase. What do you do in a big data application? You do mainly four things. You collect data, you process it, you want to store the results of the processing, and you want to make it available for querying. Here in this talk, I'm going to focus on one particular type of processing, which is real-time stream processing. What is real-time stream processing? Here we operate over real-time streams of events. And a stream processor typically consists of a, a bunch of agents, servers or computers. And um, each of these processes has an input queue that it reads events from. And then it does some processing. It may store some data. It may read some data. And then it emits new events on its output queues for the downstream processing of other, other agents. So uh, it looks pretty much like that uh, in, in, uh, in the reactor. A real-time uh, processing system is called a flow, and every individual agent there is called a flowlet. And uh, it's, a, it's a very simple programming abstraction. Now, this HBase table down here, that might be shared with other stream processing applications. So we might have another flowlet that also writes to that table. And this is all great, until two flowlets try to write to the same cell at the same time. And what do we get? Well, we can, we can flip a coin, right? We don't know who wins, which, which ride will prevail. We're definitely going to lose one of the rides. And what happens now is maybe this guy loses. So his, his ride doesn't go through because it gets overwritten by this one. But he has emitted his output to its, his output queues. So now it's in an inconsistent state. We have an event that looks like it's been processed, but the effect of processing isn't there, right? And so now we can't rely on the behavior of our application anymore. What's the solution? Many years ago, decades ago, that's what transactions were invented for in relational databases. Transactions protect us from that. And uh, our idea was that if we think about what a flowlet does, it's, it's fairly simple. Read an input event, do some processing, store some data, emit some output events. And so we implemented a way of doing transactions that encapsulates what we see in blue here in a transaction. And we implemented that over HBase. Just a quick reminder, who knows what asset means? OK, it's written there. So what does it give us? It gives us atomicity. Whatever we do in the transaction becomes visible at once. We never see partial writes gives us consistency. Once it's written, it's not going to change. We're never going to see something like flickering 
We're not, um, it gives us isolation. Isolation means we're never going to see writes that haven't been committed, right? So this is also called dirty reads, and they can be a pain when you write applications. And uh, they give us durability. Once we've written something, it's guaranteed that we will never lose it. Okay? Now, this is what we wanted to implement over HBase. What is HBase? Who knows what HBase is? Oh, everybody. Then I can skip this, right? I can skip this. Uh, but very quick, quickly, it's a distributed columnar store. It has named tables, so you can have many tables. And each table is essentially a mapping from row key, column key, and timestamp, that's a composite key, to a value. And how does it achieve its massive scale? It partitions that key space into regions, and each region is served autonomously by a region server. And these region servers don't talk to each other, and that's why all the operations are self-contained, and that's why they are very efficient. Now, thinking about assets, what does HBase give us? Does it give us any of the asset properties? Uh, it does give us durability. It writes everything to HDFS. We know data is durable there. It also does give us consistency. But does it give us atomicity? Does it give us isolation? No, it doesn't. It gives us a little bit of that. So an operation on a single cell of the table is performed in an atomic way. That's what HBase gives us. It even allows us, if we stay within the bounds of one region, um, it allows us to perform a batch of operations within that region's region uh, as, a, as an atomic operation, an atomic batch. So that's good. Um, unfortunately, as a client, I don't know what the regions are, so I don't, I don't even know whether my write remains within one region or not, so it doesn't really help me a lot. Um, what, doesn't it, what, it, what it doesn't give us is uh, atomicity across regions, um, atomicity across multiple tables, um, or atomicity ap across multiple RPC calls, multiple um, distinct operations. We don't get that from HBase, but um, in a real-time stream processing uh, environment, we need that. So uh, we implemented it. How did we implement it? Um, so we're using... Um, a transaction style that was first introduced under the name of OMID, OMID, and I don't even remember what it means. Um, and it has a flavor of isolation that's called snapshot isolation. More precisely, it uses multi-version concurrency control to implement the isolation. So um, we've seen that in HBase, every cell has multiple values, right? The key space is row by column, by timestamp. So we can use that timestamp. We can hijack that. We take that away from the application. You don't get control over the timestamp anymore. In exchange, we give you transactions. And now we uh, generate transaction IDs that are timestamps, and they'll be monotonically increasing. And we use that transaction ID as the timestamp for all the writes that happen in a transaction. And now the nice thing is that we know a transaction that's not committed, all its writes have the same timestamp. And HBase allows us to exclude, using a filter, to exclude a particular version from reads. And so we can very easily implement isolation. Um, in order to implement uh, consistency, to prevent multiple uh, multiple clients from overriding each other's values. We do not do locking like databases do, right? They lock, somebody else locks, you end up with a deadlock. That's not what we want. So uh, we use optimistic concurrency control. And uh, why can we do that? We know that two different transactions will use a different timestamp, which means their rights will not conflict. HBase will allow these rights to happen concurrently. Now, when a transaction gets committed, we need to check whether this transaction had a conflict with another transaction that happened at the same time, another transaction that was overlapping in time. And in that case, we have to roll back the transaction. That's what's known as optimistic concurrency control. Right? So this is a write that would have been blocked by a lock if we were in a relational database. Right? And this is a write that we let happen because we don't want anybody to wait in our distributed system. 
Right? So at the time of commit, we need to detect that that happened. And whoever comes later with his commit will be rolled back. Um, what's the advantage of this? The advantage is we don't need to lock. Locking has a cost. Because when I lock a row of a table, anybody else who wants to use that row will have to wait. Right? And what, what does that do? In, in the end, a lot of my processes in my cluster are going to be idle, waiting for a lock. And I'm, I'm, going to, I'm not going to get good utilization of my cluster. Um, so avoiding the cost of locking is good. Um, we also, by avoiding locking, we also avoid deadlocks. Deadlocks can never happen. Now, of course, there's a cost. There's a cost of conflict detection. And in the case that there's a conflict, there is a cost of rollback. This, this cost is higher than in a, in a traditional database. Now, why did we choose optimistic concurrency control anyway? We chose it because if conflicts are rare, if they don't happen often, then optimistic concurrency control costs almost nothing. The price is almost nothing. And if you think about how you write a distributed application, you're going to partition the work into buckets, and you're going to send that to different processes. And if you do that partitioning in a smart way, you can, you can do it in a way that you never get conflicts. Because you partition your key space, and you partition your work in that same way. Right? So um, in, in our case, this was the optimal choice. Now, how does it work in praxis? Um, so we have the HBase um, database here. It consists of many, many region servers. And we have a client who wants to use HBase. Right? Now, in order to get transactions, the client needs to communicate with a transaction manager. I'm going to go into more detail about transaction manager. But this is an extra agent that's now running in your cluster. And it manages, maintains the state of all currently ongoing transactions. Um, once it has obtained the transaction from the transaction manager, it can use that to write to HBase. Um, so we have an extra variable in the game here. Uh, the transaction manager, in order to avoid that, if it crashes, the system becomes inconsistent, or we would lose all states, we have two of those. And they do a leader election using Zookeeper. That's pretty much standard nowadays. But uh, let's take a closer look at how a transaction actually happens. So the life cycle of a transaction is client wants to start a transaction. So it makes a call to the transaction manager. Transaction manager returns a, a transaction ID and remembers in its own memory this transaction is now in progress. The client now does all its work. It can do that autonomously. It doesn't need to talk to the transaction manager anymore. When it's done, it talks to transaction manager again. It says, I want to commit. Here are the changes that I've made, the keys that I've written to. And the transaction manager now, because it knows about all other transactions, can find out whether there's another transaction that has written to the same key. And if so, it's going to say, you have a conflict. If not, it's going to say, oh, OK, all right. If it's OK, the transaction is complete, we can simply forget about it. It's now visible in HBase. But if it's not OK, now we've made some rights to HBase, right? But our transaction has to roll back. That responsibility is on the client side. The client now needs to roll back its changes. And we can do that. HBase has a way to undo a write by simply issuing a delete for that particular version that you've written. Now, it may happen that that goes through. Fine, all fine. Everything that happened in this transaction has disappeared, has been deleted, so we can forget about this transaction. There's no more trace of it. But it may happen that the rollback fails. A region server is down, uh, a call times out. Uh, who knows what happens? Uh, maybe the client crashes before it can, can roll back. In that case, um, the transaction gets invalidated. And so this happens if the client doesn't crash, but it encounters an error. It can tell the transaction manager, I could not roll back. So now transaction manager invalidates that transaction, and it remembers that. It needs to remember that, because there are some rights in HBase that are not valid. Nobody is allowed to read them ever in the future. So we have to exclude them from future, from future reads. <laughs> 
right? And transaction manager is responsible for that. It could happen that the client crashed. In that case, transaction manager will eventually time out the transaction. And when it times out, it becomes invalid too. Yes? Um, where's the state of the transaction manager? The state of transaction manager is in memory. Oh, yes. OK, so the question was, uh, where's the state of transaction manager? Uh, transaction manager keeps its state in memory, but it also maintains uh, a write-ahead log on HDFS so that in case of a crash, we can recover. And it writes periodic snapshots so that the recovery doesn't take long in, in case of a crash. Very similar to HBase itself. Yes? Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll get there. Next slide has it. Um, so uh, what does a transaction manager do? I, I already talked about this. Um, the important part here is what is a transaction? A transaction consists of three things. One is the write pointer. The write pointer is the version, the timestamp, that the writes of this transaction have to happen with. Right? The client needs to know that. The second one is a read pointer. The read pointer is, uh, is, is like a high watermark for the client that it uses as an upper bound for its, for its read timestamps. Anything that is above must be a transaction that was started later. And so for isolation, I don't want to read that, so I'm going to exclude that from reads. And then the third part is we, we have some transactions that are currently in progress. They have a smaller transaction ID because they started earlier, but they haven't been committed yet. And so because we don't want dirty reads, we have to exclude those two. And the other ones that we have to exclude are the invalid ones. Right? So that's the third part here. And um, here's also one problem. The exclude list over time can become large if we have a lot of invalid transactions, because they will never be cleaned up. The clients have crashed. Um, so let me skip to that. What we have for that is um, a coprocessor in HBase. We call that the data janitor. Um, this is a coprocessor that sits in every region server, and it, um, it knows the transaction state because it communicates with the transaction manager. And every time HBase does a, uh, does a mem store flush or a compaction, it hooks into that and it removes all those invalid writes that uh, nobody is ever going to read anymore. And once that has happened, we can remove those invalid transaction IDs from the invalid list, and then it shrinks again. Um, it looks like I'm out of time. So I'm going to skip this little section that I have about abstractions. I'm only going to say 30 seconds about this. To implement transactions, a data set or a storage engine only needs to implement four interfaces. And none of these interfaces say anything about HBase. And in fact, we have implemented this for other data stores. We've done it over a level DB, over a HyperSQL, um, in memory, and there's many others that could do this. So what this gives us is um, we can now suddenly do transactions that span multiple different storage engines. And that's quite powerful. Um, I'm going to skip this. I'm just going to tell you what's the future. Um, there, the transaction manager obviously is a bottleneck, right? There's a single transaction manager that needs to manage all the transactions in the system. We've been able to do about 30,000 per second. But in a 500 node cluster, that's not going to be enough. So what we're going to have to do is partition the key space, um, have distributed transactions with multiple transaction managers, who will then, over some consensus protocol, do um, uh, distributed transactions. I don't want to go into detail right now. Um, we want to integrate this with other transactional stores, like existing relational databases, maybe Cassandra. Uh, we've seen Cassandra has some form of optimistic concurrency control. Who saw the last talk? Uh, um, and finally, we're going to open source this. Um, it's going to happen this summer. I can't promise exactly when. Uh, we have been at the, uh, at the last HBase meetup in San Francisco and discussed it with the community. There are two or three competing approaches right now, and we, we don't know yet what the outcome's going to be, but uh, I think you're going to see it this summer, and uh, it's going to be awesome. Um, oh, this, I shouldn't say this, we're hiring, of course. Um, but uh, actually, I wanted to take questions. Oops. And...
Yeah, so there's something. This actually said questions, but we have a display, <laughs> display problem. <laughs> ah, it's gone. <laughs> All right, so um, questions, please. Yes. So, so you said you're going to open source it. Uh, wait, 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 wait. So you said you were going to open source this, this summer. Um, are you planning on putting it in uh, HBase proper on Apache, or are you going to continue to maintain this on the side, or what's, what's the goal there? Uh, ideally, we can contribute this to Apache. Yes. Um, in HBase itself, there's currently three competing approaches to do this, uh, and each one has its pros and cons. Right. So it, it may be that none of them will actually become part of HBase, and each of them will be separate projects sitting on top of HBase. Uh, it's, it, the outcome isn't clear yet. Um, in the worst case, we're going to open source it on GitHub, see whether we can build a community, and if, if the community has traction, we're going to go into Apache with it. How do you know whether you can safely clean up uh, versions of the data with old timestamps, especially in this data janitor you mentioned? Yes. How do you know if their transactions are definitely dead? How do I know? So the transaction manager knows the state of every ongoing transaction. If a transaction is properly terminated, either by doing a commit or a rollback, then we know that all the writes that have this timestamp have been deleted or they're valid, right? So then we can forget about this. It only happens for transactions that time out, where the, where the rollback doesn't happen properly. The transaction manager knows about these transactions, right? So these are the ones that we can delete. Um, now, there's another, another issue related to like version cleanup, because we only need to keep one version that is visible to all transactions. And how do we know what is, the, what is the low watermark of all ongoing transactions that might need to be visible, right? So transaction manager at any given time knows all the ongoing transactions and their read pointer, right? So if you take the minimum of that read pointer, you know that anything below that can be, can be removed. Yeah? Uh, do clients need to talk to the uh, transaction manager in order to ensure that they don't read partially committed um, or, par or a partially committed transaction? Yeah. How how they do that? Uh, do they? Uh, so is, is it mandatory that um, all clients use the transaction manager irrespective of whether they're using the transactions? Yeah, it's not. So this is one of the nice things that I skipped here. Um, so we have this abstraction that's called... Transaction aware, where is this? Um, here. So a data set can implement these four methods, right? And then the system's gonna call that, right? For, at the end of the transaction, it's gonna call commit. At the start of the transaction, it's, it's the, the transaction itself will be communicated to the storage engine or to the client. That, that makes the call. And it says, here's your read pointer, here's your write pointer, here are your excludes. But it's up to the client to decide whether it actually wants to exclude those versions. Okay, so if, if, so another, client, uh, sorry, yeah. if, if another client that isn't using transactions wants to read the data, how does it guarantee that it doesn't start reading uh, writes from uh, other clients that are in a transaction before they've committed? You, you can't guarantee that. If, um, if a client ignores the excludes in a transaction, then it's going to see dirty, dirty writes. Um, but that's the choice of that client, right? You could say, I want more performance, and I don't care. So I, I have a good example for this, right? So take uh, the, 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 the stream of all tweets. They have embedded URLs. And these URLs are tiny URLs, so when you get when you get the Firehost, you have this, this tiny URL, and you don't know where it's actually pointing to. You want to resolve that to the actual URL, and that's an expensive call. Right? So one of your flowlets is going to make an HTTP call to get that redirect and find out what the actual uh, URL is, and then store that in HBase. Now, this is a case where dirty reads are totally fine, because if that 
if, if that fetch is successful, whether the transaction that writes it gets rolled back or not, that redirect is valid. We know that this is valid. And so we can afford to do dirty reads, right? And in that case, this is also an example where the data set implementation can choose not to do the rollback. Even though the transaction gets rolled back, I leave my write there because it's still useful for others. Okay? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.